Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming. I hope you're all here for ArcPy mapping or ArcPy MP, also known as uh, map automation. My name is Jeff Barrett, and with me here is Jeff Moltz. Um, we both do a lot of things together. Uh, I work out of Olympia, Washington, and he's out of Redlands, California. But we work on all the ArcPy mapping development stuff uh, for ArcMap and for ArcGIS Pro. We're both on the layout team. Um, I special a little bit on the layout SDK for .NET. He focuses a little bit extra on some of the web map printing stuff, but we're on the same team and work together a lot. In fact, because we're in different offices, there are some people that still think there's just one Jeff that does all this work. And uh, it's actually the two of us and a bunch of other great people. So anyway, what we want to focus on today um, is to really just provide you some really good tips and tricks to get your, your mind thinking about what can be done with uh, Python map automation. And, and most importantly, you know, we can't teach you all of it in just, you know, 50 minutes. So what we want to do is make sure that you leave here knowing where to go and get the resources to, you know, steal a lot of code and uh, just kind of take off and, and do your own thing. So very quickly here, what we're giving you here is a URL. It's an Esri shortened URL, esriurl.com slash 8899. And what that does is it just brings you to a website in ArcGIS Online, which allows you to download a variety of little small applications that kind of really help you think about the possibilities of Python map automation and uh, what can be done with it. So um, as we create more samples and make them available, we put them onto this site. And of course, we have a huge help system that we've built into the, the ArcPy mapping, ArcPy MP um, documentation, and um, there are lots of samples there as, as well, but those all tend to be small little snippets. These tend to be real applications. Um, and there's just a screenshot. Now, the other thing that I want to talk to you about briefly is the migration process from ArcMap, ArcPy mapping, to ArcGIS Pro, ArcPy.mp. How many of you have worked with ArcPy mapping in ArcMap? That's fantastic. It brings tears to my eyes. How many of you have moved to ArcGIS Pro? Uh, uh, maybe a, a fifth of those people that raised their hands. So the thing is, is, you know, we've really, we've always been very proud of the fact that whatever you do with Python will just kind of migrate cleanly into ArcGIS Pro. And that's true for almost everything but our stuff. Um, so the, 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 short, the short answer is you really have to, will have to rewrite all your scripts. And there's a good reason for that. And I'll, I'll attempt to explain it right now. So here's another shortened URL, 9785. And we attempt to explain to you why um, a lot of this code that you've developed for ArcMap won't work in ArcGIS Pro. And it's, it's really simple. It's a completely different application. With ArcMap, you had one and only one layout. You couldn't even not have a layout, right? You had data frames. In Pro, we have map frames. In ArcMap, you had MXDs. In Pro, we had projects. And in Pro, we can have multiple uh, layouts. Um, we've even kind of re-architected a lot of the objects. In ArcMap, you had a data frame, and that's all that you had. In Pro, that's kind of been busted up into a map frame, a map view, and a camera, so that you have much more driving control of the objects that are in your layout. So, for example, in ArcMap, if you have a data frame in your layout, and you go to the data view, and you start panning and zooming, you necessarily affected your layout. That's not the case with Pro. We allow you to persist the individual extents in the map frame that's in the layout. So the, the short story there is we have different objects to work with. Now, the good news is even though you have to kind of rewrite all your code, it's not that hard, right? You replace arcpy.mapping.map document with arcpy.mp.arcgis project. We still have current. We still have standalone scripts but we've just kind of moved things around a little bit and we've changed the names of some of the objects, all for necessary reasons. So just going through this very quickly, you'll see that, you know, 
It's not ArcPy mapping anymore. Well, I mean, ArcPy mapping still exists, but when you say ArcPy mapping, you're telling me you're working with ArcMap. We have ArcPy.mp because it's a completely different module. It's a different library. It works with different types of objects. Many of the functions have moved. So in ArcPy mapping, you always had these root level um, functions, uh, you know, list data frames or um, list layout elements. And the first parameter you always had to pass in was the MXD. And what we did is we kind of we kind of made it a little bit more object oriented, a little bit more intuitive where you can navigate through this object model. And first you attach to a project. And then once you get to a project on the project object, you get to a list of maps or you get to a list of layouts. And then from those elements, you would get to the list of layout elements or the list of layers. So we've just rearranged those things. Same thing with export functions. That was all a root level um, command. And you would have to pass in, well, I'm exporting a data frame or I'm exporting a layout. And depending on which one you're exporting, it was a different set of properties. So we busted those out. So if you export a layout, you have only layout properties. If you export a, a map frame, you only have map frame properties. So anyway, the, the point here is, and not to go into too much more detail, things have changed. And you will have to tweak your scripts, but it's, again, a lot of search and replace type operations. All the logic is the same. So if you've learned ArcPy mapping, learning ArcPy MP is just, it's going to be the same thing. So that's good. So what we're going to do next is we're going to tag team, and Jeff's going to be talking about updating um, data sources and migrating documents from ArcMap into ArcGIS Pro. OK, thanks, Jeff. Hi, my name's Jeff Moulds. I'm a product engineer based out of Redlands, and I work on the ArcPy mapping and the layout teams. And I'm going to talk about scripting 10x documents to Pro and then workflows regarding updating data sources. So let's say you've got your hands on Pro and perhaps you have a lot of ArcMap documents that you want to import into Pro in a batch script. And we have this new function called import document that'll allow you to do that. So I'm just going to load some code here and walk you through it. So the first line is just opening the, uh, or referencing the currently open ArcGIS Pro project. And I just have a blank project open here. Um, then I import an MXD. And then I import another MXD here. And you can see I'm using the import document function. And Note that I have this parameter here called include layout. And I've set that to false in this case. So keep in mind that an MXD always has a layout, even if you never use it. You know, a lot of times you're just working in data frame view. Um, but if you're you doing a workflow where perhaps you're consolidating, you know, maybe 30 MXDs into a single ArcGIS Pro project. Perhaps you don't want all those superfluous layouts clogging up your project. So that's why we included that Boolean parameter here. And then you can see that I'm also importing some globe and scene documents. So I'll just run this. And that ran there. And I'm just going to go to my catalog window and show you the result of this script. So I'll expand the map node in the catalog window, and you can see it brought in all these 10x data frames as maps into my project. And you can see it only brought in one layout uh, as specified in my script here. So that's importing documents. And now I'm going to switch gears a little bit, and I'm going to talk about updating data sources. And updating data sources with ArcPy was something you could do in ArcMap, and I think we've improved upon it a little bit in Pro. And let's look at a workflow here where it would be useful to script and updating data sources. So I'm going to open up this map here called Layers. 
and you can immediately see I have a problem here because all my data is broken. And you can see the dreaded red exclamation mark there. So let's look at the layer properties here and see if we can find out why this data is broken. So go to the layer properties, go to the source tab, and you can see that my data is personal geodatabase. And personal geodatabase isn't supported in Pro. Um, now, in this case, I have a file geodatabase that has all these same feature classes. So what I want to do is write a script that'll just point these layers from my personal geodatabase to my new file geodatabase. And another complication here is on the Joins tab, you can see that I also have a join to a table in that same personal geodatabase. So when I run my update data sources script, I also want to make sure that my joins and my relates get updated as well. And obviously this would be really easy to fix in, in the UI, but this would be for a workflow where maybe you have a whole slew of these broken projects or maps or layers and you want to write a script that'll just go up and uh, fix them. So let's look at some code that'll actually do that. So we have in Pro this function called update connection properties. And you could run that on a project, against a project like I am here, or you could run it against a map or individual layer or a table uh, or a layer file. And this function is kind of like a find and replace. So in this case, I'm going to do a search for my personal geodatabase name, and then I'm going to replace it with my file geodatabase name. And I'm using partial paths to the data. You can use partial paths, or you can use full paths to the data as well. There's also this Boolean parameter here called auto update joins and relates and I've set that to true so that it will fix my relates as well. So I'm just going to run that. And you can immediately see that that fixed my data because it automatically updated my map. And if I go into this layer here, back to the source, you can see that it's updated it to the file geodatabase. And if you look at the join, it's also updated the join as well. Something new at Pro is that we've also exposed the layers data source object model as a Python dictionary. And that would be for workflows where you needed more fine-grained control of what's available in the update connection properties function. And that might be useful for workflows where you want to change like joins and relates properties. And so let's look at a connection properties dictionary for a simple layer here. So first off, I'm importing the pprint module. And that's just a way to display dictionaries in an easy to read format. I'm referencing this continents layer here. Then I'm getting its connection properties, and then I'm going to display them. And so that's the connection properties dictionary for a simple file geodatabase layer. And if you wanted to, you could write scripts that dig into these dictionaries and you could change any of the, uh, the pieces. So let's look at a, a little bit more of a complicated connection properties dictionary. This time I'm going to reference the, the Mexico layer that had the join on it. And then I'm just going to display it. And that is the entire data source structure as well as the whatever joins and relates are on the, uh, on the layer. So these dictionaries can get pretty big and complicated when you're dealing with joins or enterprise geodatabases. Um, but you could write, like I said, write a script that would go in and change any of these dictionary uh, values. So here's the workflow um, that I'm going to demonstrate here. So say your boss says that out of all the 
maybe hundreds of, of projects that reference this Mexico feature class and join table. The foreign key that the join is based on has changed. So that's the foreign key right there. And so could you go ahead and write a script that would go and update all those projects that reference those layers to the new foreign key? So that would be incredibly hard to do in the past, but I'll show you how you could do it now in Pro. So that's my connection properties dictionary from before. That's how I access the key and how I change its value to the new field. And then this is how I would commit the change for that layer. And I could put in some logic here to loop through all my layers and look for that foreign key and update it. And I'll show you another way <clears throat> of doing it as well if I wanted to do it in one fell swoop for the entire project. I could actually do a find and replace on dictionary key value pairs. So I could search for this key value pair that has the old foreign key that I'm trying to change and then the, the new um, foreign key. So I'll run that and then that completed. Now if I look at my layer properties and go back to the joins tab, you can see that it's updated the, the foreign key. So I wouldn't have to like drop the join and recreate it or anything like that. So, okay, so that was, I admit, kind of a, an obscure workflow, but it does show you the power of being able to dig into these dictionaries and change any of the properties that you want. And that's especially useful for enterprise geodatabase um, data sourcing, data resourcing workflows. So I have another example using enterprise. Now in this example, I'm going to update the project with a new enterprise geodatabase instance and in server. Um, so I'm just going to demo the code here in, in PowerPoint. I don't have enterprise geodatabase running on this machine. But this is kind of like the classic example of getting a new database server with a new name. And everything else is the same. For example, you have the same database, the same feature classes, the same operating system, authenticated users. And you don't want to create tons of new SDE connection files for your users. You just want to do one thing, and that's to dig into those projects and just change the Ge Enterprise Geodatabase name. So this is how you would do it. So first off, let's just look at the Connection Properties Dictionary for Enterprise Geodatabase layer. So here I'm getting a layer um, and displaying its connection properties. And this is what it looks like. And the highlighted part is what we're interested in, and this has the connection properties. And my old server is called Dunbar, and you can see that highlighted right in here. And my new server is called Shakespeare. So I need to just go in here and change Dunbar to Shakespeare. So how would I do that? So first off, I define the connection properties that I'm going to search for. And this dictionary has the old server and instance info. Then I define the new connection properties that I'm going to use to replace. And this has the new um, server uh, inst and instance info in it. And then finally, off of the project, I call update connection properties. And I'm doing a find and replace of the project, updating just those relevant pieces of the connection properties. And that will update all the layers that have the old database server. So that's updating data sources in Pro in a nutshell. And here's the help topic that describes all the update data sources workflows that I showed just now. And it has all the cold code samples as well. That's Back it. to me? Yep. Number line number one. 
You know, so we're always able to update data sources. And the reason we're emphasizing it again now is that as we migrated from ArcMap into Pro, we had the luxury of being able to modify our API because everything has changed so drastically. So we took advantage of that and we made lots of improvements and we leveraged a lot of these little Pythonic type operations by just using dictionaries rather than having to create these really complicated APIs with a string of many parameters and, and, and deal with it that way. You just grab the dictionary, you make a couple tweaks to the elements you want to make tweaks to and you just push it right back into the object. And you're going to see this pattern again and again as um, you move more and more into ArcGIS Pro. And so, for example, symbology is something now that um, we've exposed to the API. Now, this was always a really interesting argument in the past where, you know, you would approach us and say, well, I want to be able to change the color of that symbol from red to blue. And we'd say, well, no, you can't. We just haven't exposed it. And why would you want to do that, right? I mean, you, you, the whole point of ArcPy mapping was you know, you're just going to automate things. You're going to automate printing. You're going to automate updating data sources. You're going to you're not going to change the color from red to blue. Why? What's the point? And, and we had those arguments, and you guys won. <laughs> you convinced us, and uh, we caught up to you. And um, so I think what you're going to like is, is um, how we've approached this. So in the past, we allowed you to change renderers. So you could go from, um, I'm sorry, we didn't allow you to change renderers. We allowed you to change the properties of a renderer. So you could have, um, you know, let's say a, um, a unique value renderer, and you may want to go in and, and change the field that the unique values are based on. But you couldn't convert a unique value renderer into a graduated colors renderer, right? And we've, that is what we've, we've modified. And then, depending on the type of renderer, each renderer will have a different collection of symbols, and we've given you the ability to drill down into those renderers, get to the individual symbols, and make the appropriate changes. So similar to ArcPy mapping, we started a layer, and from a layer we get its symbology. Then we can get to a render. So either we can get the render, or we can update the render, right? And there are four renderers that we have available to you now. So the simple or single symbol render, and very simple example here, where we can get that simple symbol, we can get its symbol object, and from that, we can apply symbols that are in the gallery to that symbol, very simply. For graduated color, we can get to the individual class breaks, and for each class break, we have the symbol, and we can modify it. Same with graduated symbols, and the same thing with unique value, and I'll show you a demonstration of these. In addition to um, just changing the symbols using the gallery, we can also change the color ramps that may be associated with one of the particular renderers. And then we also provide the same sort of logic for raster classify and raster unique value colorizers. And there will be more to come, but this is what we support currently. So let me just show you a demonstration of how this works. So I have a very simple um, map open, and so we can see capital cities and we can see state polygons, and it's all pretty bland, and, and I want to go in and I want to modify these symbols. So I'm going to load a very simple script, and all I'm going to do is I'm going to reference my current map, find the layer called capital cities, and I'm going to reference its symbology. And if I type sim dot, you know, there's render, where I can get the render, or I can update the render. Now what I should also do is just let's look at this symbol. So it's a simple, single symbol. I want to change that. So again, I'm going to load some more code. And this time, I'm going to take it a little bit further. I'm going to change the render from simple to unique value, and of course, I need to specify the field that the render is going to be based on. So I'm going to grab the field called capital, 
And I've made all these changes to that little sim variable. And now all I have to do is push that back to the symbology property of the layer, hit enter, and I've made some changes. So now you may not be, because it's just a, it's a, a random color ramp that was selected, you may not be able to see a difference between the national capital and the state capital. So I'll just change the color ramp here, and you can see that there's a difference. What I want you to notice, though, is that, you know, in the um, um, unique value render, we have all these individual items. And so we have our national features, we have our state features, but understand in this renderer, I don't know if any of you do this, but you can actually logically group all of those items into groups of items within the renderer. And that's important for what I'm just about to show you. So let me go in, and I'm going to load a little bit more code. I'll go to my third script here. And this is pretty simple. I have some repetitive code going on here. I have my national symbol, and so I'm going into the renderer, and like I just said, there can be multiple groups of items, and I only have one group, so I'm going to grab the first group, and then I'm going to grab the first item in that group, and I'm going to get its symbol. I can apply a symbol from the gallery, and then I can also work with colors, and we support six different color models, so whether it be um, RGB, or CMYK, or HSV, um, depending on the dictionary that you're working with, you're going to specify what those values are. So with an RGB dictionary, you have three values, RGB and then opacity. Not tra it's the opposite of transparency. So this is 100% not transparent, if that even makes any sense. Okay. And then I'm going to change the size of my symbol, and I'm going to do the same thing for the states, but this time I'm going to get the second item in the group, right? And then just change the symbol again to be black and a little bit smaller. Again, push everything back to the layer, symbology property, and I very easily made those changes. And then lastly, I'm going to work with um, the state polygons layer. So right now it's using single symbol, and I'm going to update the renderer to be graduated colors. I'm going to base it off of the classification field called shape underscore area. I'm going to specify the number of breaks. And then what I'm going to do is I'm just simply going to go through every single one of those six classes that gets generated, and I'm going to use the HSV color model grab its last value, right, and set the opacity value to be 50%. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to essentially set all of these polygons to be whatever the default symbol is, but then set it to be 50% transparent. And there we go. So the way that you did this in the past in ArcPy mapping is you would have to author these layer files and set up all of this capability and then you would use the update layer um, uh, function to update the symbology. So you'd essentially borrow the authored symbology from a layer and apply it to another layer inside of your map document. We now gave you the ability to go in and, and tweak this. We have grander visions, kind of a road ahead, to treat symbology in Python, similar to how it can be dealt with in the .NET, where we give you complete driving control, we give you access to the cartographic information model, and you can get to anything. Um, and this way, we don't have to keep building this managed API with more and more objects. We'll give you the keys to the kingdom, which will allow you to kind of just get to the SIM definition, update a SIM property, and push it right back to the layer. So there's even more symbology coming, which is really, really exciting. I don't know how I got off my slide here. Let me just slide down here. And then the last thing that I wanted to talk about today was new at 
one. Oh, that's interesting. I'm getting a different view. New at 2.1 is we've introduced map series. So understand, we're, we're trying to move a lot of the capabilities that you had in ArcPy mapping into ArcPy.mp. And what we just introduced at 2.1 is map series. So everything that you did with data-driven pages and the data-driven page object, that's what we call in Pro map series now, okay? There are some subtle differences. Everything in our map was kind of based on an index number. We've rewritten everything to work with a page number. It's just, it's a more intuitive uh, element to work with. So if you actually work with page numbers, you don't have to figure out what the index number is that corresponds to that page number. It's just simply the page number. Um, but you have all the export capabilities, um, working with selected features and, you know, we're working with map frames instead of data frames, but it's all essentially the same thing. What we plan to do for Pro, uh, which we couldn't do in ArcMap, again, kind of a road ahead, is we want to be able to give you the ability to author map series from scratch, right? So in ArcMap, it had to exist, it had to be enabled, you could attach to the object and change its limited number of properties, but if you just had some sort of analysis that created this output, and from that output you wanted to generate a map series, you couldn't do that. And we plan on giving you that capability in the near term as well. So that's all that I wanted to cover, and then Jeff will talk about um, web map printing. Okay, thanks Jeff. So most of the stuff you do with ArcPy.mp and Pro, you can also share as a web tool to an ArcGIS portal with a federated server. And a common ArcPy.mp workflow is web map printing, where Python, the JavaScript API, and the web app builder all work together. And the print widget in the JavaScript API or the web app builder is going to reference your own web tool. And the Python script used in the web tool is going to use this function that is new in 2.1 called convert web map to ArcGIS project. And this function takes a web map that you intend to print or export and converts it to an ArcGIS Pro project. And once it's converted, the full state of the web map exists inside of the project. And that's the powerful part. Because now that you have the access to the web map inside of the project, you could use ArcPy.mp to modify it for you print or export. And notice that the second parameter in the function is called template page x, and that's highlighted on the screen there. Um, and a page x file is a layout file, and it stores a layout outside of an ArcGIS project. And this parameter allows you to inject the web map into a map frame on a layout. And you could author, author rich cartographic layouts to use when printing a web map. Now your script would output a printer-friendly file such as a PDF or PNG. And generally when you hear the term web map printing, we actually mean export to PDF. So why specifically is ArcPy.mp useful in a printing app? Well, it allows you to do more advanced stuff in your web app like the export using advanced options like uh, large format or high DPI or use any of the um, advanced exporting parameters on our export functions. You could export map series. You could export to PDF and insert additional pages like a title page at the beginning or report at the end to create a complete map book. Um, you could also swap out service layers for local vector data for vector PDF output. And the screenshot at the bottom of this slide shows the advantages of swapping out the map services in your web app for depth vector data that you could stage in the ArcGIS Pro layout templates. Now the one on the left shows a 96 DPI tiled cache map service. And you can see um, some of the features are a little bit pixelated. Um, the text looks a little bit jagged. And that may be okay for some situations, but what if you want really high quality cartographic output? Now the other screenshot on the right here 
shows vector data and it's much smoother and will be more appropriate for high quality output. And the vector layers will be staged in the ArcGIS Pro layout templates and then used in the Python script. And you need to personally have these layers. So this is for workflows um, where you have your own map services and you have the vector data already. Um, now, staged vector data layout templates aren't the only way to get high quality output from a print service. Um, if your map service uses dynamic layers, the web app could request a high DPI uh, image from the server. Um, feature services are also vector, vector tiles obviously are vector, so there are a lot of options. Now the screenshot here is uh, the PDF output of the James Bond web app that I'm going to demo in a moment. And in this demo, I'm going to show another advantage of using vector PDF output. Um, Adobe products such as Adobe Reader will allow you to embed feature attributes from the map in the output PDF so that users of the PDF can actually click on features and see the uh, attributes that were in your uh, geodatabase. Um, you could also export georeferencing info and embed that into the PDF. And you could also um, expose um, map layers into the output PDF as well. Um, and that means that the end user of the PDF can turn layers on and off. And that's wor worth mentioning because this experience is actually better in Pro because the Pro PDF exporter um, has been improved compared to the, map, uh, the ArcMap PDF exporter. And the limitation in ArcMap or in 10x was that if you had any type of raster or map service or transparency in your map and you exported that to um, PDF, that would flatten your entire map into a, uh, a single flat image. And that's not the case with Pro anymore, so you'll always have those PDF layers in the output. Um, and so you could be able to turn those layers on and off, and it'll also look better as well. Um, this example is also going to uh, utilize map series and it's also going to utilize dynamic layouts in the template. So dynamic tables, charts, grids, and text will all react to changes in the uh, map extent. So let's take a look at the script that I'm going to use to do all this. I'm going to show you the code in a moment, but first I want to just look at the parameters of the script. So here's my script tool in a toolbox. And I'm going to look at the uh, parameters. Now it's important to talk about the script tool parameters. And the parameters must have specific names and types in order to be compatible with the print widget. And those parameter name specifications are in the, the function help. So these four parameters that I have here are required so that I could use this um, script in the print widget in the web app builder. Now to create this um, web tool, I share it just like I would any other script tool. So I, ru I run it, then I right click the result and I click share. And that'll publish that to my portal. Now let me show you, now to save time, I've already shared this to my portal. So I'm gonna open up my server manager and just show you the service. And this is it right here called export map series. So I've already shared that script tool and it's been published to my portal. And let's open it up. And let's look at the, the rest URL. So I need to use the access this REST URL in the Web App Builder. So let me show you Web App Builder. 
So this is Web App Builder here, and Web App Builder is a way to create web apps without having to actually write any HTML or JavaScript code. And this is my web app that will print locations of James Bond movies. And it was really easy to make. I only did two things, really. I ref first off, I referenced a web map from my portal, and that web map has my um, James Bond movie location points, and those are these red martini glasses here. And then it also has a, uh, a base map. And then I added a print button, and that's right here. And the print widget is part of the web app builder. And to configure the, the print widget, you click this button here. And I've already configured this to use my own web tool. So this is the REST URL that I just previously showed you here. So let's run this. Okay, so I'm just going to zoom into an area that I'm interested in. So let's say something like this. area in here. Okay. Um, then I'm going to press the print button. And I'll just give this a title, Dev Summit 2018 demo. And Here's my layout template, and in this case, I just chose, I just published this with one uh, layout template. Of course, I could have had as many as I wanted here, for example, for different page sizes and different orientation. I've also published this with just one format to keep things simple, but of course, I could have added all the formats here if I wanted. The print widget also has this use, these useful advanced options. So if I wanted to force the scale to be something, you know, like 1 to 50,000, I could put that there. I could add this metadata, DPI, etc. I'm going to choose this option here to preserve the map extent. And then I'm going to press the print button. And so it's, right now, the, the print button calls my print web tool, which is running my Python script. And this job actually, in this case, takes a little bit of time because the Python script is going to actually embed all of the feature attributes from my um, James Bond map service. Um, no, actually, it's going to embed all the feature attributes from the geo database that the um, the uh, the map series was based on into the PDF, and that operation is a little bit on the expensive side. Um, but if you don't embed attributes, which is the more common workflow, then you could output really large uh, PDFs here in just a couple seconds. So that finished running. And I'm going to click that here to see the output. And so the first map is just the extent from the web app. And then um, then I got all the country pages that had a James Bond point in them, and I export all those map series pages as well. So notice as I move from uh, page to page, a lot of stuff in my PDF is updating. And I didn't actually use Python to update any of that stuff. That's just a property that's available in the UI. So the, the table changes to only show features in the map series shape the uh, chart updates as well to just show the features that are in the map series shape. Um, notice that the grid here along the, uh, the north and east side of the map is also changing as I move from page to page. So you can see here, well, that's really hard to see, but there's a three degree interval here. Um, here's a 30 minute interval. 
a one degree interval. And also the page text down here is also updating as I move from page to page. Now, I'm gonna open this up in Adobe Reader and show you some more stuff. So in Adobe Reader, I could use the geospatial location tool here. And as I move around in the mouse, in, in my map with the mouse, you could see the coordinates updating in the bottom right. And then I could also view the attributes of the data using the object data tool. So now if I click on a feature, you can see all the attributes from the geodatabase in, in here. And then I can also explore the data by clicking in this window as well for all the features. Um, Adobe also has this kind of nifty measuring tool here so you could see distances and bearings. Um, so your, the PDF that's generated is actually almost like a little mini GIS. So you could, that would be useful to share with uh, clients that maybe don't use GIS. Now let's open up the, um, the ArcGIS Pro project that I used to create this layout. So I'll move back to Pro here. And this is the project that had the layout that I used to create the PageX template file. And I just want to quickly show you how a lot of this stuff is dynamic in the, uh, in the layout. So for example, if I click this ta table frame here and then go to its properties, you can see that it's being filtered to just show the map series records. Um, same with the chart. Right down here, you can see the charts being filtered to show um, just the map series, stuff that's in the map series shape. And let's look at the grid as well. So if I go to the grid properties, you can see that I have the interval here set to automatically adjust. So what that means is that as the, the map frame extent changes, the interval of the grid will also change so that the, the interval is never too sparse or too dense. And if I look at the grid properties here, you can see there's all sorts of other stuff you could add to the grid, like uh, grid lines, ticks, labels, corner labels, intersection points, interior labels, and you have a lot of options for each of those grid components in the UI here. So you can create grids for different styles like uh, geographic, lat long, or UTM. And coming at 2.2, we're gonna support um, UTM zone convergence so that you'll be able to map adjacent UTM zones. And one other thing here is that the, the layout metadata text is also automatically linked to the um, title that you saw that I entered in the print widget. Okay, so let's look at the Python script that made all this possible. So this script, it's actually pretty simple. I'm not going to go through every line here, just the, the most important parts. So the first thing I want to show here is this is where uh, I get the web map um, JSON as a parameter from the, uh, the print widget. Now JSON is the format of the web map and it contains the full state of the web map. For example, the, the layers, the coordinate system, the extent, the scale, and so on. And you as the Python developer don't have to create the JSON. The print widget did it all for me. Uh, next I get the format of the output. Then I get the layout template as a parameter from the script, and I store my layout templates in a uh, folder registered with the server so that the web tool has access to them. And then I 
run the convert web map to ArcGIS project function, and it takes the web map JSON and it injects it to this map frame that is on this layout right here. And that returns an ArcGIS project. Now the bulk of the script is just referencing layout elements because I do a little bit of turning stuff on and off before I export. Um, I also here, I turn off the service layers from the web map and that just leaves the vector data that I had staged in my templates. And then I do some turning on and off some stuff using the visible property and I export the layout to PDF and this gives me my first page and that was the extent from the from the uh, from the web map and I'm choosing to also in my PDF to expose the layers and the attributes and also the georeferencing info and then I perform a couple um, select by locations here and that'll just get um, all the map series pages that have James Bond points from that are within the extent of the the web map and that will then this line gives me the selected uh, page numbers and that's using the map series object that uh, Jeff mentioned um, and then from the map series object I call export to PDF and I'm going to export a range of page numbers and that's the page numbers that I got from the select by location functions and again I'm exporting into PDF and embedding the layers and the attributes and the georeferencing info and then I do some PDF I append the PDFs together because there's two PDFs generated the, the, the overview extent and the map series and I append those so it's just one PDF that's returned and that PDF is set as the output parameter of the script and that allows the print widget to display that output PDF um, in the web app and so that's the end of the demo and here's a help topic uh, for the convert web map to ArcGIS project function that goes into a lot more detail about this workflow and I think that's it how are we doing for time? I think we're doing great. Do you have any, anything else? Just uh, to remind you to fill out the survey. It's very important now that we don't have those paper sheets anymore. It's a lot easier for you to just forget to evaluate these workshops, but it's very important to us. So um, determining how well we did, determining the size of the rooms we need, et cetera. So please take some time, fill out your surveys, and if you have any questions, we'd love to entertain those. Thank you. Any questions? How large was the, the PDF? How large? Those, uh, the question is, is how large is the PDF? And in that case, um, it's about, I think, three and a half megs. So it's not too crazy, you know, because I, I didn't have too many features. There, you know, I was probably embedding like 80 features with um, maybe a dozen fields. So in that case, it's not too crazy, but you have to keep an eye on that because if you act, try and embed thousands of features with a lot of attributes, your PDF could shoot up to like, you know, hundreds of megs. So it's, you know, you have to be careful with that function. Yeah, and remember, you, you don't have to export yeah. attributes at all. Yeah, and, and that's uh, not the default. The default is not to embed attributes. So you have to specifically tell it to do it. Yeah, that's a good question. Thanks. Another question. That's it? Okay, well, thank you. Enjoy oh, the conference. Oh, oh, you'll come up? Okay, okay, well, enjoy the conference. Enjoy the party tonight.